Jeez. And here we are again. And here we are again. <laughs> and after four years, we know each other for four years, we finally had a DCI class. Only we, four years? Yeah, only four years. Okay. And we finally we taught a DCI class at Kotkan, Romania, in Shara. It was time. <clears throat> and let's start. It's not an easy subject. Or it, is, it was not for us. It is for me. <laughs> yeah, it is for you. Yeah. But uh, let's start with the beginning, or at least what it is in my head. I have the feeling, my perception is that now when we speak about programmers, it's about just syntax exports, and that's it. How do you see it? Is it enough? Oh, well, I mean, and, I mean, that really is not a DCI question, but I mean, I, I found that with, um, oh, I think, you know, a wide variety of, of, of programming audiences. I mean, and I've taught in universities, I've taught in, in industry, um, and yeah, I mean, there, there's, there's kind of a scale of maturity about with which people approach design. And I think a lot of it has to do with, um, with part of the organizational structure, and the kind of roles that people are given in, in the company. So I mean, a lot of structured companies, you know, hierarchical companies, will will leave the design to the architect and to the designer. And then um, there's this view that I mean, the coders just do coding. And I think this has become more popular in the past ten years, especially with more and more programming being outsourced to uh, to uh, to the east. Um, you know, well, to Eastern Europe, to uh, to the Asian subcontinent, to, uh, to other places that, that, for the time being, have lower costs. Um, and I, I have mixed feelings about this because <clears throat> I keep I keep predicting gloom and doom, saying you know when you send it to these people, uh, either the software is going to be very very high cost, or it's going to be low quality, or these products are going to die. Yet. For some reason, you know, software just, just keeps running, it just keeps going, it keeps going. I do think the overall quality of software we see today is, is lower than it was um, 20 years ago. Um, website crash more, uh, telephony features are less reliable, um, airline reservation sites are more clumsy to use, human interfaces are, are less adept. And I think it may be that we're paying the price that way. Um, and in some sense, that reflects, well, in part, your question that, you know, programming has become a lot about, about writing code. And, and in the context that you asked that question, you know, here in just the, the wake of the DCI class, there's maybe a hidden expectation in your question that it has to do with, with deeper appreciation of, appreciation of technology or... <clears throat> the paradigm issues or the philosophy of programming issues, some of the things we've talked about in the class. I think the single largest reason is that we haven't been attentive to the user interface. I mean, Jeff Raskin in his book called The uh, Humane Interface said the interface is the program, the interface is the product. And the software is just the crap that has to go along with the interface to make it work. And, and too many nerds are focused on the technology and the programming and uh, they love the technology a lot more than they were like working with people. And to understand human interfaces, you need to be working with people, you need to run uh, end user workshops, you need to do user studies. And I mean, your average nerd is much more comfortable staying away from people and, you know, playing with themselves with, with the technology of the kernel. I think that that change in focus and the, the hope that just programmers together with their magic frameworks will automatically or semi-automatically generate the GUI for them is probably the, the bigger reason behind the, the lapse in software quality that we're seeing. What role plays for a programmer to know the domain for whom is doing the architecture, the structure of the program, this domain analysis? Because sometimes it seems like it's some of them abdicated this part. And in the context of DCI and domain analysis, how it fits? Yeah, I mean, again, I wish we had some hard data on this, and I wish there were some some, some studies and some data. Because you just want to answer a question like this, I'd like to have some data to stand on. But all I can do is kind of postulate. So, well, let me postulate. Um, a 
number one, it, somewhere in a software effort, a software effort, effort, there has to be some kind of domain expertise. And uh, I mean, it kind of goes without saying. And in the old days, we said, okay, the domain expertise is out of the end users when we gather requirements. Well, we found that doesn't work. Um, and part of the reason is that the shape of the information they got from end users was wrong. Uh, so we said, you know, what are your requirements? Requirements being the, the sine qua non. I mean, we must have this. In a complex domain, end users don't know what they want. And so, I mean, in the course here, I put up these quotes from, uh, from people like Evernote that says, you know, that, that working with end users is a, is a great way to understand what you did wrong, but I mean, it's not going to tell you what, you know, what you should do to do things right. And uh, um, people from, uh, what was it, the, uh, from Lean Startup were saying, you know, of course, of course we listen to end users, or we, we talk to end users and we listen to them, but we almost never did what they said. We just use their input as, as one source for the decisions we had to make about what product we take forward. So I think this whole thing about putting the, the authority of domain knowledge in the end users was a failed experiment. And, and now we're talking more about you know, where did the domain experts fit. So Scrum has answered this by saying, I want a product owner who's really invested in the domain and who owns the product. Most Scrum people don't understand that. And they, they kind of equate the Scrum, the product owner with a, with a, with a product manager. So someone who says product management skills, and okay, it doesn't really matter that they're invested in the domain and own the domain. Uh, they'll learn that, right? What they need to do is know Scrum. And I, I think that's that's an extremely immature and uninformed and, and damaging perspective. So to me, the product owner should be a domain expert. It should be the passionate, passionate driver behind, behind the product. I think kind of the, the early Scrum myth, and I have to admit, I bought into this myth, is that you know, the product owner owns the product, and, and they have the job to communicate the, the business domain needs to the development team. And then the development team has the, the good chops for, for, under, for mastering the technology. So they're great at, at modularization, they're great at object-oriented programming. <clears throat> but, you know, as I've uh, grown up, um, to do great modularization, you need to understand the patterns of change in the domain. You need to understand the shearing layers. Uh, you, in being in charge of the implementation, there are several things a, a product owner, I mean, simply doesn't know. Uh, and one of, my, one of my favorite examples, and again, I gave this example in the class, is uh, a talking head many years ago said, well, you know, object-oriented development is easy, and domain expertise doesn't matter. And so let's say you're going to build a banking system. I mean, you make the simplest thing that could possibly work, trademark, you know, on a quote, and, uh, and then you evolve. Inspected that from there. So if you're going to build a banking system, I mean, well, what's a bank account? A bank account is something which you can add to a balance and subtract, and subtract for a balance. So the first software you build for a bank account is a calculator, and you can add and you can subtract, and then you evolve from there. Now, if your developers don't have domain knowledge, and the product owner has kind of that view of the business view of an account, the product owner is going to come to the team. And she'll tell them, okay, you know, here, here are the requirements. So we're going to start with a very simple, you know, um, a minimal viable product. And the team is, who doesn't know banking, okay, so we build a calculator. And they don't understand that the real customer in the bank is the auditor. Okay, and that, that what a bank account is, is a transaction law. And it's, it's audit trails. And it's a ledger. If the product owner, the product owner is not going to have the internal implementation domain expertise, and so I'm going to have to count on the developers to do this right. And I don't, I don't think there's any way that iteration is going to take you from a calculator to a database system with with ledgers. Um, just, I don't see the path from there. And if, if there is a path, it's extremely inefficient and very very high cost. So there's been this more egalitarian view of Scrum where the, the product owners and developers kind of develop the product, product backlog together. And the product owner still has final say because the product owner is accountable for, for return on investment. But yeah, I mean, you really do need that domain expertise in the developers. You can't just count on them having a computer science degree 
and having the product owner be able to throw something over the wall and expect that something big is going to come out of it. There is another detail here. Uh, you, is the work of Ivaria Corson and Alison Cole <coughs> regarding use cases. I like that Rigby Rinskauk also called them business activities. How this fits in the DCI, the programming, the design? So I like use cases. Um, I also know use cases can be abused. And uh, I also know they're really broadly misunderstood, or at least misappreciated. And I, I think that's because in the early days, when, uh, when use cases first came out, uh, Waterfall was still very much alive and kicking, and people were using use cases to, to structure the requirements of a whole list of Waterfall requirements. And of course they're very heavyweight if you use them that way, just because you know a total enumeration of all your specifications is very heavyweight. And so I think use cases got a bad rap because you know people have used them. Um, Alistair Corbett, I think, kind of, well, could have saved the day. I don't know if he did, but I mean he, he did some work with uh, with some of the Swedes and uh, looked at use cases and then wrote this wonderful slim book. Um, I mean, Ivar Jakobsen himself, I mean, and he's this wonderful guy to have beers with and kind of a fun guy. And I remember a keynote he gave once at Uppsala where he said, you know, I wrote this really, really wonderful book on use cases and it, it starts on about 300, page 357, right? And so, you know, the rest of it just, you know, is blown. And Alistair came up with this nice thin little book and very pragmatic. I mean, Alistair is very pragmatic. And I think has a very, very common sense view of the core of use cases. And what the core is, is in the same sense that we know as architects the need to structure your software, you also need to structure your specifications in a complex domain because there are dependencies between them, there are issues of timing and alignment, there are issues of, of, of variations on a theme, and I need to structure those variations and gather them around the thing that makes them common. But there's many, many kinds of phone calls, um, three-way calling, call forwarding. Um, what happens if the if the, the callee is busy? All of those are part of the same use case, and the use case provides an umbrella for structuring them together because uh, they may not live together in the code. And so I need a, an oracle where I can go. To, to investigate what these feature interactions are. And use cases are a way of structuring that. Yet they do that in an incremental way. I mean, the whole purpose of use cases was to be able to, to change things incrementally. So they're a perfect agile tool. And people, because of this heavy weight use in waterfall, I mean, people, people can't see that. They know they're, they're too jaded by the bad experience that the industry had with use cases. So, I think use cases are a really great tool to, to provide a centerpiece for discussion. Now again, one of the things I teach, um, number one, the code is the design, not the documentation. And number two, we use, we use documentation in human endeavor for two reasons. One is to communicate, I mean, I can write you an email. And the other is to remember, I can write a shopping list. And to a first approximation in great software development, we want to avoid waste. And writing things to communicate is waste. It's much more effective with questions and answers, with feedback, with full presence, to be able to communicate verbally and orally. If things get out of hand, if they get complex, or there are things that we need to remember and we need to structure that knowledge, use cases are a really good way of structuring it. So, yeah, there are complex domains, like, like telecom, and medicine, and aerospace, where, I mean, just a simple, Verbal communication is not going to be enough. So we do need something that is a way of structuring the law of the decisions and agreements we make. And I really like use cases for this. Um, there are other ways too. I mean, state machines can be used for, for tracking specs. Um, uh, there are times when user stories are a great front end to the process. All these other tools like uh, personas, like um, um, like user narratives that come from a really good studious, you know, investment in, in studying the, the market. All these things are valuable. They're all tools. And I think depending on the needs of individual projects, they're going to have to look at all these tools together and figure out what works for them. Um, I would just advocate looking at, at use cases as one of these tools. 
though it might seem unrelated, when you said that, it popped in my head is that the idea of compression abstractions, and you said something very interesting. Abstractions as contract and as a boundary of trust. Usually, I didn't have this in mind. Can you expand a little bit more? Because it relates to this business <coughs> thing with the domain. With yeah, so, I mean, <laughs> in my growing up as a programmer, I guess you've got through several phases. I mean, when you're in university, you thought that everything should be an abstraction, right? It's really good to, to defer decisions about implementation so you can think soundly and solely about the business concerns without being distracted by the implementation. And I think that's fine in the old days for really, really simple, um, uh, simple problems. But like I say, I mean, if you're not attentive to the fact that that banking account is really a transaction log and audit trail and you abstract that away or you defer the decision to deal with that, then you're going to end up doing a lot of rework. And so at some point in my career, um, it was actually the first influence, so there's two big influences here. And one was, was, was Richard, Richard Paul Gabriel, um, who was uh, the CEO and founder of, uh, of Lucid, which was a Lisp company many, many years ago. And I mean, um, together with Guy Steele, the architect of, of languages like Scheme and CLOS, I think both of them were involved in both of those languages. So I mean, Dick, Dick has, has, has some really quotable things. And one of, his, one of his quotable things that I say a lot is abstraction is evil. Uh, and he has an essay um, about abstraction being evil. And I mean, the, the computer scientists are always talking about abstraction and, you know, not really getting down to the point and leaving things fluffy and leaving things undecided. Um, and this is, this is an undisciplined way of doing design and you end up being surprised because you haven't had the discipline to face the hard problems. People abstract. What does abstraction mean? Abstraction means throwing away information in the interest of focusing on some information which tends to be of interest right now. So I guess if you, if you abstract enough times and change your focus enough times, so you'll focus on every part of the system, then you have the basics covered. But usually people who abstract will have, will have a, a one-trick pony. And so they'll abstract very single-dimensionally and they'll focus on one one thing that you know their favorite professor or their boss or their customer is asking them to focus on, be it performance or, or use cases or maintainability, and then they abstract the rest away, and you end up getting a one-legged system that, that cannot stand for very long. And so I think this really resonated with me when, when Dick said abstraction is evil. So then I was starting working with Trippy, and that this gets us more to, to, to the data construction, data context and interaction paradigm. And in, in BCI, we have this boundary between what the system is and what the system does. So we start out with kind of an understanding of, of the domain analysis, you know, building the, the bricks, the building blocks of, of what the basic structure of the domain is. And then we have the activities, the, the business logic, the use cases, um, which are what the system does. And of course, in a, in a system, they need to interact very closely and very tightly for an efficient and well understood um, user experience and business workflow. But from the point of view of maintainability, these things evolve at different rates. So from the point of view of software engineering, we want to keep them separate. So there's kind of a paradox here. We want to keep them separate, but we want to keep them together. So DCI handles this with magic. And I don't know if we'll get into the point of magic in the interview. Um, but from the point of view of software engineering, we have this boundary between them. And the boundary reflects a sharing layer. Like architects talk about sharing layer and architecture. So different parts of a building evolve at different, different rates in different parts of the building. So interior walls can move as a remodel. You know, they may remodel this hotel and move this wall to make this conference room a little bit larger, make the hallway a little bit smaller. And moving, you know, moving this internal wall, well, okay. That's at a certain shearing layer that I can probably move that wall in a month. 
If I wanted to enlarge the hotel and get this outside wall and move the meter that way, I mean, there's, there's a six month or one year, one year uh, exercise. I don't know how old, how old this building is, but that's a, a pretty solid stone wall and it's gonna be a lot of work to change it. And I wanna separate these two things so I can evolve them independently. So there's this layer in between them and trick there, so if you're install, calls this an abstraction layer. And I said, you're really making me uncomfortable, Trinkley, because abstraction means that I'm going to defer any decisions about what's on the other side of that boundary, or I'm going to separate any consideration about what's on the other side of that boundary and throw that away in the interest of focusing just on the thin API to what's on the other side and be focusing on the business logic. And he said, well, okay, kind of, but he says, I'm going to say it in a different way. What an abstraction boundary means is that I trust what's on the other side of that boundary. And because I trust it, I do not need to worry about it. So when I teach DCI, I mean, how do you, how do you build this trust? Um, I think a really powerful principle comes out of DCI is that these domain classes are so simple that it's easy to understand them and therefore I can trust what they're going to do. Now there's, there's some simple principles like a domain object that is something on the other side of that contract, of that, of that abstraction boundary, should not go running off and start interacting with a lot of other objects because now I'm not going to be able to understand it. If I can't understand it, I'm going to have a lot harder time trusting it. So there's some kind of engineering rules in DCI that the stuff that's on the other side of that boundary should be very, very simple. So I can understand it. If I can understand it, I can trust it. Now, the stuff on this side of the abstraction boundary, the business logic, the use cases, the, uh, the stuff, the, the what the system does stuff, okay, we can review that, we can test it, we can prototype it, we can model it, we can put a lot of our effort there because the risk is a lot higher because that's where the complexity is. And so I want to put my focus on the complexity. And Trinkby is saying, okay, that's fine, but you know, the stuff on the other side of the abstraction boundary, I want to keep the complexity out of there. I want to keep that simple. So I mean, I once, um, Trig, Trig is a small part program. I'm not. You know, I program in Objective-C and C++ and Ruby and a lot of other languages. He's basically a small part programmer. And I once read some studies where they, they looked at some small talk code and uh, so what's the average size of a small talk method? If you look at the you know, mature small talk programs, it's three lines long, three executable statements. I had told Trig this, he said, no, that's poppycock, that's balderdash, they're not that small. So he went over his code and measured it. Guess how long his methods are? Three lines long. <laughs> um, and this is why they're simple. But I mean, he's done such compression that each line is so rich in its functionality. Why is it rich? Because it's building on, on other things that have been built up to have very, very rich semantics. So I've kind of built a rich vocabulary of classes that are very, very expressive. So each line is extremely powerful, but again, very understandable, so that these things can work together with very, very simple logic that does very powerful things. Regarding the magic word you have used, so yeah. on, the, on the part with the, what the system does, you mentioned about the roles, responsibilities, relations. Does this help in, 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 in this magic part? Well, the magic part I was referring to was the magic of the technology that you use to make DCI work. So, mm -hmm. so kind of the whole principle of DCI here is is I want to be able to understand the code. I should be able to read the code and understand what it does. I can understand the main code because it's so simple. I mean, there's not a lot going on there. And I mean, I probably don't even need to test it. I, don't even, I mean, it's probably not even cost effective to test it. I mean, it's, 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 it's very easy to make it. When it's to make it, it's unit tested, right? Yeah, I mean, even, even unit testing. Unit testing, most unit testing is waste. Um, because it, it just it just becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. I mean, the same people who write the code write the unit test, and so the same assumptions that they're making, or the same good assumptions and bad assumptions, 
going through both the code and the test. So it just becomes a way of reinforcing, reinforcing the bad assumptions. So I think that really, really good domain classes are, are true by construction and by social review. So I'm a, I'm a big, big believer in, uh, again, in the early days, I was a big believer in code inspections. Then became a big believer in pair programming. And now again, I've become a, a big believer in code inspections. Code inspections are back. Um, kind of surprises me, but I mean, they, are, they do work and they do have value. So that makes that code understandable, right? You know, I either will have a gang reviewing it or it's very simple. Um, the reason that the other part, the what the system does part stuff, is, is understandable is because instead of having the use case code scattered all over the place, it's all in one place. So instead of having now let me rewind a little bit. One, one of the kind of popular metaphors for object-oriented programming in the early work, in the early days, I should have mentioned this in the class and I forgot. So, so how does nature work? How does the ecosystem work? Well, ecosystems work because of the complex interactions between the parts of the ecosystem. So you know, I have a plant giving off oxygen over here, and I have an animal giving off carbon dioxide over here, and soil here, and the sun here, and water here. And those things all kind of interact in complex and mysterious ways, and life happens, and growth happens, and the ecosystem works. And so there isn't going to be any single place where I can look for, you know, what, how is the ecosystem evolving? How is life happening? And kind of the metaphor for object-oriented programming was it's like that. So I'll put a little bit over here and a little bit over here. And somehow a miracle occurs and all the objects just kind of magically work together and it all works. And this, is, this was kind of the oops on metaphor for object-oriented programming for a long time. And maybe there are some things that are like that. Um, I mean, the internet is kind of like that, right? There's no centralized intelligence or centralized control. On the other hand, we have things that are, that are human intensive and, you know, from, from Kay's original vision of supporting, supporting human mental models by taking those models and putting them into the computer, um, I shouldn't need large scale interaction to be able to take advantage of object-oriented programming. And so this nature metaphor kind of brings down, where this nature of emergent value, where emergent behavior kind of breaks down. And so this is um, not what Alan Kane meant when he was trying to do, for example, the Dynamo Project to, to help children understand. So it was more, you know, having the computer be an extension of, of the human mind. He noted, he said, you know, children are not skilled up pigeons or rats. I mean, they have algorithms for going out and exploring the world. And so it's not that the world is doing experiments to them. They are doing experiments to the world. And they have ways of reasoning about the world. He calls these operational models. And he, he takes this, this word from psychology. So, so I don't know if this comes all the way back from Piaget, the French psychologist, or if he got this from Pepper. He was working with a psychologist named Pepper. Um, which is the way that children structure their knowledge. It's, just, it's in terms of algorithms. And, and so it's not this goofy emergence that we use the para, the, the, para, the, uh, the paradigm of nature and emergent, emergent uh, behaviors for. But rather, it is something that's structured that we can analyze. Now, it's not formal. I mean, it's not something that's going to be able to follow formal you know, algebras or provable rules or things like this. But it does have the notion of sequence and the notion of an algorithm. And I ought to be able to write that algorithm in software to capture you know, what it is the kid wants to do and to be able to review it and read it and reason about it and be able to do what ifs and uh, to understand it. And so that's the, the what the system does part. Those things involve the different sharing rates. In the end, they become part of the same system. And it's not like there's a, a single hard wall with, with all of the what the system does stuff on this side and all of this what the system is stuff on this side, but rather the system kind of differentiates itself into these little parts called objects, each one of which has a what the system does and what the system is part. 
each of those objects is going to have an abstraction boundary that allows people to write the code about what the system does without having to get into too much detail into what the system is. And for a given use case, that is for a given, a given operational model, for a given algorithm, there is a way of grouping together all of that what the system does logic into one thing, and that's called a context or a use case. And we tend to to write these use cases in terms of special special names that we give the objects, and those names are the roles that the objects play. So that's kind of a summary of what of what DCI is about, you know, from a perspective of where this abstraction boundary fits. So you mentioned role, and it's a new word. It was a new word for me in the context of object-oriented programming. Because Good. for me, yes, okay. I know it's an old one when I discovered the papers like 30, 40 years ago. Because you are James Cochlean, but you are a father, you are a teacher, and we can model this, and the secret to do that is the idea of roles. And that's why you mentioned the, this thing with RRR, roles, responsibility, relationships. It's a technique to make these objects play the those roles, right? Yeah. Yeah, this, this RRR thing, I mean, maybe for the sake of the audience, it's just worth going into a little bit of the history here. I mean, I, I think a lot of people out there are going to know what CRC cards are. Classes, responsibilities, and collaborators. And this came, maybe Rebecca Wurstbrock invented them, maybe Ward Cunningham invented them, maybe Kent Beck popularized them. I mean, it's not clear who exactly the inventor was, but there were all these people together in Tektronics, and you know, something great happened, and uh, I don't think anyone really cares about where the credit is. But I mean, these, three, these three folks were together, and they were using just paper index cards to simulate objects and to write down methods in an anthropomorphic simulation of an object-oriented programming. And uh, then I got in trouble in using the term CRC in the Netherlands because it's uh, classes, responsibilities, and collaborateur. And you do not use the word collaborateur in the Netherlands in the 1970s in talking about anything. You know, it's a very bad word. So I started calling them helpers. So the CRH cards. And then I was uh, bumped into Rebecca Wurstbrock, and she says, oh, I now call them RRR cards. Roles, responsibilities, and relationships. And I love it. I just love it. And she said, you know, um, and I, I don't even know if they knew this at the time. I actually think Rebecca did. Rebecca is a very, very, very sharp person. And she, she said, you know, these, these weren't always roles. And I'm not sure why we call them classes. Um, and even Kent. When when uh, when Kent was was evolving his pedagogy for CRC cards, he says, "Okay, well we have our CRC cards on the table, and when we're on the table, they're classes. If if we're talking about my my CRC card talking to you as you pick it up, and in the air it's an object on the table, it's a class. Well, all a role is a role is a name." of an object according to its use in some context. That's all a role is. And I mean, they're not new. Um, well, it depends what new means. I mean, um, you know, you know, you know, actor, there you go. That's a role. And uh, uh, Kara, Hewitt, Kara Hewitt has been doing actor kind of based development and got an understanding of how object-oriented programming works in the sense of, of interacting actors. Uh, and I've really come to appreciate his, his view of object-oriented programming a lot more since I've gotten into DCI and, and understood the initial, the initial aspirations that Alan Kay had for objects. Um, yeah, I, mean, I really think that the actor's model was, was probably right on. I mean, he would resound to a lot of things that people didn't understand at the time. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Rebecca talks about responsibility-driven design. So, I mean, a system has to, has to implement a lot of responsibilities to all of its stakeholders. Well, what's responsibility design? It's finding what responsibilities belong with each other. We call that cohesion. They tend to belong together. 
because I'm de 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 developing the code for them together and they belong together. Okay, it's going to be easy to write the code because all is very cohesive. Um, I need to, to assign responsibilities to different parts of the system. Well, what are the parts? You know, how do I apply the knife? What is the right shape of knife that's going to allow me to divide up the system and assign the responsibilities in a way that will allow me to reason about functionality locally and to evolve functionality locally and to support business goals locally? An answer is a role. A role is a collection of related responsibilities. So responsibility-driven design is kind of a matter of identifying the roles and adding the responsibilities to them, or identifying the responsibilities and then understanding what is the role that corresponds to that collection of responsibilities, um, which, which came first, the chicken or the egg. Uh, and, and having a system, which is a collection of understanding of how roles interact. And I mean, this, this, is, what, this is what CRC cards always were. And so in some sense, in some kind of vulgar sense, what, what, what BCI is, is a way of taking the flexibility and the brilliant insight of CRC cards, of being able to distribute these responsibilities to roles and turning it into a programming paradigm that can be real code. So it, this year was created to make code more readable, understandable? I think, I think that if, if I were to find a primary reason, that would be it. The, the number one goal is readable code, understandable code. And the, the reason this is important is that for many reasons and to a large degree, a lot of the current object-oriented pro programming code is not understandable. And the reason it's not understandable, at least, well, it's understandable to the nerds. So you ask a nerd about, you know, where is this class? Okay, they can bring up the class on your screen. You ask the nerd about, you know, where is, where do I deal with, with this particular kind of resource? Okay, they can go and find that. If I ask the nerd, can you, can you reproduce the operational model that the end user has in their mind, and they're going to use the, use, the, the computer in order to, to carry forth their operational model. Remember, Kay's goal was for computers to help the, the human in carrying out these operational models. So we want to take the operational models out of the human, human's mind and get them into the computer, right? So they become an extension of the mind of the human being into the network, into other people's dynamics, and, and so on and so forth. So if I ask a nerd, can, can you tell me the operational model? They can't find it. It's not in the code. It's blown up all over the place. It's all over the code. Because what programmers will do is they'll get <clears throat> requirements and they'll say, oh, well, I need to make the system dance like this. Okay, so that's a little bit of change to how this object works and a little bit of change to how this object works. And the way that programmers deal with objects is with their classes. So they're going to go into the classes which originally come from the domain understanding, right? The building blocks of what the system is stuff. And now they're going to go in, and instead of having this nice abstraction boundary, this contract, this contract of trust, they're going to say, okay, well, what the heck? I'm just going to go inside that boundary, and I'm going to add what the system does stuff together with the what the system is stuff. And now we have these two shearing layers mixed inside of the same object, inside of the same class. Well, that causes tension. This is how earthquakes happen, you know, when two, two tectonic plates, you know, rub against each other and one is moving faster than the other. And that's what current object-oriented systems are like. People will distribute that knowledge to the classes. What they should be doing is distributing it to the objects. And the problem is, is when we read code, we read classes. When code executes, it executes objects. And people will say, well, they're really the same thing. A class is, an object is just an instance of a class. Well, no, it's not. 
I mean, that's a very C++ centric view. So I mean, you talk to people like, like Carl Hewitt, who say, what's a class, right? You know, we do actors. You talk to people like Dave Unger, or Chang, you know, the, 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 art, the, the, the author himself, the self language, what's a class, right? I mean, they're doing object oriented programming, not class oriented programming. So most people today, most programmers, they, they say they're doing object oriented programming, all they're doing is abstract data types. So they know, you know, it's, uh, oh, I used to do string with all the unique string functions. Now I'm going to put those string functions together into a nice class called a string. And that's going to be the abstract data type I use. I still have main. Oh, I might put main inside of the class, and the method is called do it. And those like to say I'm doing object oriented programming because it's in the class. But the structure is still largely procedural, it's still largely imperative. I can find who's controlling and what's controlled. And the, the abstract data types tend to be the stuff that's controlled and I have the good old fashioned process in main, just like I did in Fortran. Object-oriented programming is more about distributing this knowledge around so that the responsibilities get distributed across the objects. And I think the mistake that the industry made is that they equated objects with classes and so I, and so on saying, that, yeah, we need to have autonomy in the objects and distribute these responsibilities around. That's fine. But they said the way we're going to do this is, is give each object autonomy by distributing the responsibilities into their classes. And now the understanding of a given operational model, of a given use case, is distributed all over the place. There's no single point of understanding an algorithm. There's no single place to go to understand the code. And what's the worst? How do these things uncouple to each other? They don't uncouple to each other through object calls with polymorphism. These are hypergalactic go tos. And so, I mean, when I see when one part of the algorithm is handing off to another, I have no idea from reading the code where that's going to go. I have to wait until runtime. So, I mean, we've completely, completely destroyed readability by making this confusion between classes and objects. So what DCI does is it says, okay, we're going to, we're going to distribute the functionality, the responsibility across objects, but we're not going to split up the use case functionality and distribute it across classes. We're going to put that into one thing called the context. We're still going to divvy it up a little bit in terms of things called roles and methods on roles, but they're all going to be in one place so I can read them and understand them. I know you have made also research on this part. With the context, with the DCI, can you detail a little bit? Um, yeah, there, there's some wonderful research um, we did with uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic uh, Institute, where they got some, some real programmers and, and some students, and we had them do some programming and analyze programs, both in Java and in a, a, a DCI kind of based programming language called, called Plinvid. And we measure things like, uh, can they answer questions about the code? So, I mean, if I, if, what happens if I change the value of i here? You know, what's, what's the impact of change? Can you tell me? By reading the code, not by running it and testing it. From reading the code, can you understand what the impacts of change is? Well, let's say I want to change this. Where in the code would I change it? Um, and then they also asked them to make some changes to the code and then measured the amount of time they spent in different parts of the code. And they asked them, you know, where's the action at? You know, where, where do I really need to be paying attention versus sending the code? And with statistically significant results, uh, they showed that, that the data context and interaction paradigm um, greatly reduces context switching. And so the the folks are focused on, I mean, and th this is, I mean, in the survey about, you know, where is, where's the action at? What's the primary object? I mean, there was 97% consensus. This is one of the numbers to remember from the, from the survey. Um, about, okay, this, this is going to be the primary place where I mean, where I do the evolution of the, of the software. And so I got, I got my, my programmers focused 97% on this, on this one context. Instead of doing multitasking and going to all the windows, multitasking is extremely expensive. I mean, we know this from, from psychological study after psychological study. Um, 
They were also also slightly better to be able to answer questions about you know what what happens if we make a change here. Um, there were some surprises, like they also measured time spent to make a change. It turns out there was not a lot of difference, I think, in time spent, if I'm remembering the, remembering the studies right. But there was much lower cognitive load, much better efficiency, uh, much better understandability, um, and sometimes much, much lower level of cognitive stress in dealing with the design under DCI than there is under standard object learning programming, standard Java. So, I mean, these were extremely encouraging results, real empirical results. Thank you a lot, James. I'm, I'm so glad that we finally had a DCA class and that we spoke personally about that. Oh, well, thanks for the opportunity. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing your first DCI program. So get to it, start writing some code. Yep. And uh, look forward to next time. Thank you.